Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And of course, I echo the thanks to everybody making this possible, right? Thanks for you to uh, for, for being here. Um, I really appreciate um, you, you know, your willingness to spend a little time with us uh, exploring the notion of our scholarship, the notion of how we're losing it, and what we potentially can do about it. Um, it, I, I would really prefer this. That's why I'm not standing behind this thing because I'm not want to leave the impression of hiding behind something, right? If this was a very interactive session, that would be incredible. So please, at any point in time, feel free to interrupt, raise your hand, speak up, right? Uh, um, uh, raise your questions, your comments, your concerns. Um, even if it's only, you know, hey, I, I didn't catch that. Can you repeat it, right? If something doesn't make sense or I'm mumbling, speaking too fast, right? Please, at any point in time, interrupt me. Um, uh, that is that is very welcome and perfectly fine, of course. Mm -hmm. Uh, since we don't have a chat, you might ask the Zoom participants to just unmute to ask their question. Oh, yeah, 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 that's a good question. Um, um, so we have a number of folks uh, online on the Zoom call as well. Uh, of course, that holds true for you too, right? Uh, at any point in time, please uh, either unmute yourself uh, and or leave your question or comment in the chat. Um, is there anybody else from here in the chat room? It's just this group. But you might uh, yeah. uh, connect to the Zoom as well, so you can keep an eye on the chat because sometimes, especially when you share your screen, right, everything else disappears because that's how this is supposed to be designed. Uh, so it makes it a bit difficult. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so yeah, good, good call. Um, so maybe without further ado, I'll, I'll start. And actually, uh, um, Sarah covered a number of those things already, but I still wanted to briefly uh, do an intro uh, of uh, well, who am I? What am I doing here? Uh, What's, what's my background and how this potentially can relate to you know your daily uh, work and life. So Sarah mentioned I'm a, by training a computer scientist and I have an appointment as a, as a scientist in the research library at Los Alamos National Laboratory. As you may know, uh, the lab is usually more concerned with uh, nuclear physics and material science and uh, high energy physics and all these sort of things. But we also have a, a research library that's fairly active in the domain of, of course, uh, research related to digital libraries, scholarly communication, all these uh, sort of things. And within that uh, organization, under that umbrella, I'm, I'm leading a small uh, R&D team uh, that is concerned uh, with aspects of, uh, well, uh, uh, digital preservation, right? Archiving, especially archiving of uh, web resources, things that we publish, things that we put happily uh, on the web and share there. Uh, however, uh, it will probably not be a secret to you that there's not too many orchestrated efforts in actually archiving and preserving that sort of content, right? We are much, much better in archiving and preserving our uh, 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 printed books from, you know, 70 years ago or 50 years ago uh, than we are taking care of the intellectual property and digital content that we're creating these days. Um, so within that, and, and I've, I've bounced a little bit back and forth, right? Got my first degrees in Germany, that's where I'm originally from. Uh, did uh, my, my graduate work at the East Coast in, in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, then got my postdoc at the lab, actually in the very same group that I'm leading now. Uh, then you know kept moving further west. Uh, spent two years at UCLA, hit the ocean, and went back uh, to to Santa Fe because I like mountains better than the ocean. And uh, so since then I've you know gotten a real job as a as a scientist there and um, leading the the prototyping team ever since. And uh, if you're wondering. Well, what well, research library at a national lab and then a, a, a research team in there that seems really odd and it kind of is a little bit odd. Uh, but it's basically similar to a faculty appointment, except for the teaching requirement beyond that is very similar right I do uh, services of, of you know reviewing and uh, uh, on dissertation committees and uh, things of that nature I get grants internal and external. Um, I have a joint appointment with what we call the New Mexico Consortium, which allows me to get grants from the ILMS, for example, or the National Science Foundation, things of that nature. Because otherwise, as you may know, there are difficulties working at a government funded institution getting NSF money is difficult, right? It's like double dipping of sorts. So um, uh, that, that's where I'm embedded. In, uh, uh, that's kind of a uh, unique situation, and I'm super fortunate to be there to have it. Uh, I also want to say that up until recently, I'm not wasn't just only the, on, the only scientist in the research library, I was also the on, only foreign national in the research library, which also always made for fun sort of, hey, can you test the system? Does it work on your computer network? Because uh, foreign nationals are on a different network. Um, so that has changed. Now we don't have any foreign nationals in the library anymore. Um, just as an environment, uh, to give you an idea of what LANA looks like, and literally what LANA looks like is this, in case you haven't seen it, you haven't been there. Um, it's in the middle of nowhere, and that's by design in New Mexico, high altitude desert. 
uh, beautiful weather. Um, if you're struggling with altitude, this is not your environment. If you if you if you go for green chili, this is your environment. Um, the top left, the bottom left picture is the canonical picture that you have to take when you're there. Uh, I actually don't know whether it's original or rebuilt, but this is you know the picture that you have to take. Um, the bottom right is our beautiful library building. Uh, this may resonate with some of you walking around this campus. It looks right there. Uh, it resonates. Uh, and then the, the, uh, the campus itself is huge. I don't have a number at the top of my head, but there are roughly 14,000 employees at the lab throughout. Um, I think uh, just about 50% live actually in the town of Los Alamos and everyone else lives in the surrounding areas, including myself. I live in Santa Fe and that's uh, uh, an hour commute basically. Uh, uh, one way, right? So uh, it was, of course, designed to be in the middle of nowhere. So you know, physicists could do their, their thing, right? Uh, wouldn't be disturbed, including by spies or other uh, sort of adversarial um, activities. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's a bit remote. Uh, of course, it makes it you know interesting for for uh, for hiring and recruitment. But it's an incredible place to be. You're surrounded by a ton of very very smart people. Uh, and uh, the, the research capable is not just uh, uh, unique, right? Absolutely outstanding. But it is a, it's a government institution. I am not a government employee, as you may know. Uh, Texas A&M is one third of the consortium that man helps manage the lab. So I'm a contractor, government contractor employed by Triad. Triad, TAMU, and uh, University of California uh, consortium manage the lab. So it's a bit of an odd sort of setup, but that's yes, too much detail. All right, so that's where I come from. Uh, so I'm at liberty to do these sort of uh, research explorations of, you know, what do we publish, how do we publish it, how do we try to take care of it, how do we archive it. Uh, and, uh, you know, in an organization like Los Alamos uh, is, of course, interested in, uh, in, in exploring these sort of notions because, you know, we create a lot of content, right, just like in the university campus with as well, we create a lot of intellectual property and uh, how can we make sure that you know next generation or 30 years from now we still have access to those sort of resources that's the sort of thing that keeps me up at night and uh, that I, I enjoy exploring so i'll to share a little bit of that with you so and again right at any point in time if something doesn't make sense please please interrupt me at any point in time this whole research endeavor basically is under the umbrella of well scholarship happens on the web and that's a good thing right happily all of us most of us use some of these tools, most use all of these tools, right? Uh, I keep referring to Sarah's blog, Sarah's blogging, using Medium or another tool, putting content out there on the web, uh, on a platform of her choice. And that's a good thing. So it enables us to share our ideas, to share our content very, very quickly, to disseminate to a very broad audience. Uh, we can version our, uh, our resources and uh, there, there are a number of advantages, of course. You recognize GitHub, I'm sure, as a, as a repository for sharing code, uh, for versioning code. Uh, there are some uh, other uh, authoring tools on here, Zotero as well, and so on and so forth. Right? My point is, there is a vast spectrum of uh, what you may call productivity portals on the web that make your life as content producer, as scholars who publish easier. And we happily use these tools, and that's awesome. Um, however, it may come with a couple of side effects. Uh, that I, I want to um, uh, investigate a little further. There are, of course, others that have looked into this uh, much more closely than I have, especially I want to refer to the one on one innovations uh, overview. That's you know, the, the circle overview. This graphic by now is dated, I think, an overview of these productivity portals as we know them, right? And how they may be classified. So if you're looking for a much more detailed overview of what those tools might be, that, you're, uh, that are, are, are available to you that you can use, that's a really good resource. Point remains, everything happens on the web, or scholarship happens on the web, right? We're sharing information on the web. And what does that mean? The fact that we do, <laughs> the fact that we do create content online also means that translates to our citations, to our references, right? Um, even if I go back to my dissertation, what feels like a hundred years ago, there was a good mixture of references to things that live on the web, and references that things, physical things that live in the library, let's say, like books and chapters and, and journal articles, right? But I also reference GitHub repositories and uh, blog posts and YouTube videos, right? The entire spectrum of uh, knowledge, basically, that is available to us openly on the web. So these graphs are just to demonstrate um, the free increased frequency of such references from scholarship to resources that live on the web. 
that is an increasing trend, right? These graphs all go up um, uh, with the uh, correlated, somewhat correlated for the increasing number of papers that we publish, right? So that's an international trend too. We're publishing more and more. And not only do we publish more and more, we also cite more and more. We cite more and more that is online, right? That's the whole point. So it is, an, it is a problem that we, uh, we need to take care of the content that we cite, because the imaginary case, I wrote a book 30 years ago. Uh, if you cited my book, um, someone else that would read your article citing my book would still be able to obtain a copy of my book. Right? Maybe you have to travel to some far away library if it's a rare thing, for example, but it's still there, right? For uh, there's a very good chance. Me citing Sarah's blog, uh, imagine yourself five years from now reading my article citing Sarah blog. Is that still there? Uh, I would I would wager less so, right? The chances are low, let's put it this way. So uh, there's a real problem. That's what I'm trying to convey with this. Uh, because as I just tried to you know, basically outline a little bit, what happens to those references, right? Are they stable? Do they break? Do they change? Well, all of the above, I guess, is a good estimate of the answer to this question, right? Uh, as I'm sure you know, the web is a very, very dynamic medium. Right? Things disappear all the time. Things change all the time. Uh, some things are stable, but uh, how does this relate to the things, to our scholarship, to our scholarly record? Which says, you know, you're writing a thesis, you're writing your master's project or any other sort of paper uh, or, or even a blog post, right? Your references is what makes this thing whole. You're expected to have, for example, a related work section in your dissertation. Well, without references, that's not much of a related work section. That's just, you know, empty statements, right? So there's an issue there. Let's look at some of those. Um, I'm sure you have all seen examples like this. It gets better, don't worry. You've all seen examples like this, right? You bookmark a page in your browser. Six months later, you come back to it, and, and, and it's gone, right? The content has disappeared of sorts. You get this infamous 404 page not found error, which is a standardized HTTP error, conveying that something has gone wrong with this page. And that's an example of that. And uh, that's a, a, it's always an interesting challenge to find an example like that. Um, I tried to find an example on uh, tamu.edu, didn't find one within five minutes, so I aborted mission and I went to this page, which is the official City of College Station website, <laughs> and within two minutes I found this. <laughs> so that's a representation of the link rod thing, right? The page is gone. And to put this a little bit more in context, this is the page that you were redirected to when you were applying for a death certificate. Oh. I thought that was kind of an interesting yeah. context, right? Yeah, the yeah right? Yeah. Page is gone. The, yeah. So anyways, literally two minutes of me just randomly clicking on links found this one. So it's a problem. It's a real problem, right? For various reasons. Right? There's system administrators uh, you know, making mistakes, right? People make mistakes. Uh, technology is not perfect either. Um, people leaving, people on vacation, uh, things burning down, flooding, all these sort of things happen, right? Uh, that cause link rot. Link rot, as I'm sure you know, is the definition of something breaks. You get an error like this. So you, you can handle this, right? It's, it's one thing. But there's another side to this uh, notion of things not working in terms of references anymore, which is what we refer to as content drift. That basically means content on a website, the website still works, even over a spread of time, but the content changes and content changes significantly. So here's an example of the Digital Libraries Conference in the year 2000 uh, that took place in San Antonio. The canonical URL of this website was dl00.org. We tried uh, what it looks like now, but this is what it looked like in the year 2000 when the conference took place. And I'm sure as you can imagine, a few years later, it looked like this. 2004. No idea what that is, but I'm pretty sure it has nothing to do with the digital library conference, right? So what happened is most likely the domain registration expired. Someone else took over and said, hey, dl00.org sounds good. Probably has a little bit of page rank or whatever. I take that on and I publish content that I like, whatever that is. 2005, the same page looked like this, right? And uh, then for quite a while, for the last six years or so, it looked like this since 2008. It has recently changed. But the point remains, it's still nothing to do with the Digital Library Conference um, and just other stuff, basically, right? So put yourself in a position of writing, let's say, a blog post about the conference, let's say, in 2001. You, of course, cite the canonical website of the conference, 
and I'm reading your paper or your blog post now, and what I see is this. Well, that leaves me at the very least utterly confused, right? It's like, what did the author intend to cite here? This, I, I don't know, right? So uh, this is just to, to give you an idea of the notion of how things are bad and how things can break, right? Uh, link rot, the, the, the link absolutely breaks. And uh, content drift is a notion where the link doesn't necessarily break, but the content changes potentially to an extent that is not representative uh, of the content anymore that you intended to cite at the time of writing, right? So a number of years ago, uh, during a Mellon funded project with the University of Edinburgh together, we coined the term reference rot as the a union between uh, of link rot and, cont uh, and uh, reference rot, I'm sorry. Link rot and uh, reference rot, sorry. Link rot and content drift together makes reference rot. When you're referring of something going wrong with your references, uh, we refer to it as reference rot, which could either be a case of link rot or a case of content drift. You'll notice on the bottom of the slide, um, it was just a late edition last night, that the canonical project webpage, hyperlink.org, has undergone the same scenario as uh, dl00.org. Domain expired. I pinged the folks in Edinburgh, I was like, hey, what's going on here? And of course, we're investigating. So uh, the page has changed has nothing to do with the hyperlink project anymore. So I went back to an archive version to put the proper link in there. So, you know, it, it kind of an implied life use case of how this can, can happen. Project websites are chronic to, to disappear or to change, right? Because funding runs out and then who pays for the domain registration or the web space, right? This happens all the time, almost worse than faculty web pages. All right, so my point here being is reference rot happens all the time. Uh, regardless of whether you write a paper or a thesis or blog post, you use references to things on the web, it will very likely be subject to reference rot at some point. There are several reasons, of course, for that, and I alluded to, you know, the administrator being notification or whatever, but there are also things uh, on a more conceptual level, meaning, I uh, apologize, Sarah, I keep coming back to your blog post, but just because I am as a, a author cite Sarah's blog post, doesn't mean that Sarah knows about it or cares about it for that matter, right? Her intentions with her blog post may be completely different uh, compared to how we usually try to take care of our scholarship, preserving it and archiving it and metadata and all these fun things, right? Uh, Sarah has, has a completely different agenda with her blog post and rightfully so, right? So there's a completely different notion of custodianship for these resources than there is to what we were used to uh, 30 years ago when we wrote our stuff on paper, right, and put it in a library on a shelf. So uh, that is a, the, the, the most significant difference. The, the level of custodianship is different. And um, the other thing also is that it's, it's a web resource, right? It's just because I cite it doesn't mean it's any more stable than others. Just because I chose to cite a YouTube video doesn't make it uh, any less or more or less compliant with you know copyright laws, for example, right? Or just because I cited and I'm you know uh, or even uh, because you know someone important cites it doesn't make it any more stable. It's just a web resource uh, subject to any sort of catastrophe or any sort of change, just like anything else. And I'm sure you've all seen this in you know browsing the web, right? Things like that happen all the time. All right, so. No, you may say, well, yeah, okay, I, I get it. You know, links break, big deal. Uh, YouTube videos disappear every now and then, who cares? But it doesn't really make that much of, an, of a difference. It doesn't really uh, uh, threaten our scholarly record per se. And I would argue, yes, it absolutely does. And um, I'm, hopefully I can contribute for the next few examples of scaring you a little bit more. So uh, that's just uh, my, my, my blunt attention here. Um, the Supreme Court cares, right? You, you may remember this from a number of years ago, a New York Times article that looked at uh, the availability and the accuracy of references to resources on the web that were used within court rulings from the Supreme Court. And that's a different animal than my blog post, right? That's Supreme Court cases. They have discovered the web. They reference things on the web. But of course, even even if it's a Supreme Court judge, doesn't mean that those references are any more stable than others, right? They disappear as well. They found a staggering number of uh, uh, broken links of link rot and a staggering number of uh, content drift as well. What's interesting in this context, I think, is apparently, in the, and I'm not 
at all familiar with the legal domain, but from what these folks that conduct this study told me is, you, in, in legal writings, you often can look at the link and you can uh, follow the link and then you can manually say, yes, this is accurate or not, right? This is a subject of uh, a content drift or not. It has changed to an extent that it doesn't reference the intention um, or represent rather the intention of the author anymore. And that's because if you try to do this at scale across different disciplines, that's really, really hard to do, right? Because what was the author's intention 10 years ago? Uh, maybe you can derive from the citation context, but maybe not, right? In the legal domain, apparently it's easier because you reference certain cases or whatever. Uh, not sure, but so that, that's an, an interesting problem to tackle, uh, like content similarity over time. So uh, Supreme Court cares. Another uh, driving down this road a little bit further, the Supreme Court notion. This is an example of a web, ref, uh, web resource where the owner of this domain has realized some Supreme Court ruling references my page. This was about some gambling case, if I recall correctly. And that person, that system administrator said, ha ha, that's fun. Let's change the content of my page and completely ridicule the Supreme Court ruling. And that's exactly what I think is uh, uh, what the person did here, right? Basically saying, oh, aren't you glad that you didn't cite this properly? So uh, um, just to, to further support the point that, you know, things change. In this case, things change intentionally to ridicule the, uh, the notion that no one had considered the persistence and the perseverance of the content. And there are a couple of other examples like that. There's actually an industry around this now. Uh, we recently read an article about this that uh, people sell you expired domains that were cited in the New York Times <laughs> because it's the New York Times citing you and the domains have expired. So you can, it's a marketplace to buy the space and put your content up there because the New York Times is still citing you. So, all right. Yeah, whoever comes up with that, you know, incredible. All right, so Nano should care, right? Obviously. So we ran an experiment like this uh, in the outward facing uh, lanl.gov domain. So the, the, the canonical URL that represents all of the lab um, and looked for broken links. Well, yeah, two and a half minutes or so it took us to find a link, but we did this at scale. We crawled the entire, entire domain and uh, looked for things that were broken. And this is just an example of how things can really break because, excuse me, on the left hand side, you see this unavailable service of one that's not a standard error message, right? This is just now coming up with something. But it also is the page that you get redirected to in case of link rot. So they don't show you a 404 error, they show you this page, regardless of what link it is that is broken. You always get redirected to that. It's like a default, right? And uh, it gets worse because this is not an HTTP 404. So on the protocol level, it's hard to identify that as an error. This is an HTTP 200, which means ah, everything is okay. So a machine thinks this is okay. A human, of course, thinks ah, this is not okay. It's an error, right? So it makes it very hard to analyze these, uh, these dimensions of link rot at scale because the machine thinks everything is fine. But of course, you can look at the content. They always look very similar. Uh, maybe there is a certain level of redirects on the HTTP level that you can measure and so on and so forth. There are some hybrid approaches, but it makes it really, really difficult. Right? So because again, a human thinks ah, that's, a, that's an error. I need to find it elsewhere. Machine thinks, hey, everything is cool. Right? So that uh, there's a big disconnect when you're trying to reach, research these things at scale. Another side effect of this is there are more than 32,000 archived version of this page. Because again, a machine thinks this is all cool. This is all okay. So machine being the crawler of a web archive crawls this thing over and over and over again, 32,000 copies of the same thing that is an error page, right? So it makes for an interesting study of how errors, you know, evolve or not over time. But it, and it's the same, of course, with search, with search engines, right? Uh, um, web archives are not unique. They're just machines like, like not dissimilar from a search engine. So since they think it's all okay, I'm making copies of this over and over again. So that's bad. That's a majestic waste of resources, right? And maybe there's a research endeavor in this somewhere. I'm not sure, but 32,000 copies really. And that's just the internal archive, just one archive. All right, so that's a uh, bad side effect. This sort of a scenario where a human can clearly identify a page as an error, but a machine cannot, at least not easily, is what we refer to as soft full force. There's a body of research around that too. Because soft, because well, yeah, on the protocol level, it's not uh, on, a, on a human consumption level, basically, it is. But it takes 
domain knowledge, it takes some sort of intelligence to identify those. Right? And I can kind of understand it from the system admin point of view. You're trying to be maybe accommodating to a browser, to human browsers. Uh, you know, an error page is not fun to look at. Maybe you want to uh, uh, offer some, some more intelligent content. Sure, I get it. But at the very least, on the protocol level, that should be a 404. All right. Uh, of course, I would be here if, if this was if this claim, if I wouldn't support this claim, right? That authors, of course, should care. So this is an example of a paper that is by now 10 years old in the DLib magazine. And DLib magazine was uh, a web based, it was an HTML um, publication, which is awesome. And, uh, you know, the number, the vast majority of references in the bibliography section that have a URI in it or URL in it are gone now. And maybe you can read some of those are ePrints repositories. So those are digital repositories, institutional repositories. They should be by definition stable, right? But of course they're not. So right, within 10 years, and it's just one very small example, within 10 years, the vast majority of those references are gone. And uh, I believe I did an uh, investigation of whether those are archived somewhere, so you could potentially recover them. I don't recall the outcome, but I do recall that at least a couple of them were, were gone and there was no archival copy available. So, right, talking about your scholarly record, yeah, in, in, in serious jeopardy. Am I scaring you yet? Good. <laughs> I'm not getting political, but there is a case to be made here uh, that, you know, beyond the Supreme Court, beyond the author, beyond the government lab, everybody should care. This is the Environmental Protection Agency website about climate change in the year 2016. Again, I'm not getting political, but this is what it is. You get some information on what it is, right? Mm -hmm. This is the same web page in the year 2020. The same URI, right? 2020. And I, I don't recall how long this stayed up, but it, it was for the vast majority of a four-year term, just coincidentally. This is the, the same page now, right? So you get the notion of, uh, well, you get the saying of uh, winners uh, of right history, right? It's, it's kind of like that sort of thing. So uh, the, the, the notion of ephemeral resources or ephemeral states of resources on the web uh, translated over uh, you know, a serious uh, a, a spread of time makes a difference, right? It, it, time matters. It matters when you look at life resources on the web because they change all the time, intentional or not, uh, with impact, political or otherwise or not, right? But those things happen. So that is certainly something to, to consider. So that doesn't make sense so far. Okay, cool. So we looked at this at scale um, as much as we thought possible. Uh, a number of years ago, we ran a study looking at different corpora from uh, the physics preprint archive, a random sample from Elsevier and uh, from PubMed Central, the open access focus, and looked at the notion of how many references to things on the web do we have over time. That's represented here by the blue uh, area. And how many of those are gone? How many of those are subject to link rot? So really don't work anymore. And you see also that fraction uh, increases over time. Right? So the point is, even though, no, uh, how to put this, we do reference more. We have more references to things on the web over time, right? That makes a lot of sense. But we also see more things breaking over time, even for more recent articles nowadays. But of course, your chances of recovering a reference to a thing on the web in a paper that was published, let's say, in 2001, is really, really low. Right? That makes a lot of sense too. So it's a, it's a massive problem for link rot alone. But even let's look a little bit further at content drift. Uh, the picture gets, gets much, much worse. So here are the three corpora that I just mentioned. Publication year is more recent to uh, uh, fill out. And uh, everything in black here is link rot. So those links don't, and this 100%, right? Uh, everything in black doesn't work anymore. Everything in different shades of blue is subject to an uh, uh, increasing level of content drift. So really only if you take uh, this bar here, uh, there's 10% link rot, and then 70% or so of things that have changed, and only the most light blue, the, the lightest shade of the blue, is unchanged content for references in those papers published in this case in 2012, right? So 80% of references are either not working anymore or their content has changed to some extent, to some extent of similarity, 
right? And of course, this doesn't tell you the significance of that similarity change, right? So if I, uh, if I just fix a typo in a blog post, for example, well, that's not too much of a change, right? It's still okay. If I put a not in front of something, that may make a change, right? If I put a, if I change my comma somewhere in a number, that may make a change. So it's, it's hard to really analyze the level of, the semantic level of change. So tactically, we can measure it, right? The character similarity and so on and so forth. But what it actually means, it's really hard to uh, analyze at scale without really talking to the author, I guess. So this was just an analysis on uh, how much have the characters changed and the key phrases and so on and so forth. But my point remains, right? Uh, over time, that's why you see these, these blue bars just increasing to the left. Over time, it just gets worse and worse and worse. References from papers published further out, even only five, 10 years ago, are in really bad shape. Right? So that's, that's basically the point here. And this is millions of articles and I don't know, three million or so uh, references to things on the web that we looked at. So that's kind of, uh, I, I still think to date, the largest scale study of that sort. It's not all bad news. There are some uh, stable references. So in this uh, experiment, we, we found this one, which is a faculty page from the University of Hawaii. Um, on the left-hand side is the version of that page uh, from 1997, which is when the citing article was published. <clears throat> and uh, this is what the page looks like today. So just by visual analysis, that's the same, right? Or you know, close enough. And there might be some differences, but in an example of where a page can actually live for 20 plus years, it does happen. Um, yeah, but it may be, it may be rare. And right? so um, just want to not completely frustrate you, but maybe also a highlight. So that happens too. So one thing that we frequently hear, and it's a very valid point. Don't we have this thing called persistent identifiers? Don't we have DOIs, which we use to cite our scholarship. And yes, that's absolutely true, right? We do have uh, what we call digital object identifiers that are usually assigned to uh, scholarly articles, books, book chapters, but increasingly so also assigned to code, data sets, you name it, right? Um, in one of our investigations, uh, we found that, you know, this is really great and uh, it, should, it should be cited like, this URI, right, right? So this is kind of the, the HTTP version of the DOI. You should use this in your reference list, for example, in your bibliography, but people don't. And uh, I'll, I'll get to, to one possible explanation, but um, if, you, if you just copy and paste this one into your browser, this is DOI reference, it will redirect you to a publisher website, which is usually referred to as a landing page, and that has a completely different URI, right? Uh, in the case of Springer, it's usually link.springer.com or springerlink.com, something like that, and then some, some other cryptic stuff. And from what we found is that's most likely what users simply copy and paste from the browser. Right? So you do your uh, due diligence, your related work section, you try to find articles that are related to your work, you look them up in the browser, and rather than using the DOI, which takes a little bit of work to actually discover and then copy and paste from this landing page, you just copy and paste the URI from your browser, from the, from the address bar, right? So that's most likely the explanation why people do that, uh, but it completely uh, goes against the point of a digital object identifier, right? Because the idea is that this thing uh, always redirects to this landing page, even if the URI of the landing page changes over time. So really I was just going to say, JSTOR does this really insidious thing. I don't know if they're still doing it, but at least for a while, um, the feature where you generate a citation, where JSTOR says, do you want to cite this? And it gives you a citation to the resource in various different styles. They would include the JSTOR stable link, so sort of the equivalent of the CCM, mm -hmm. um, instead of the DOI. Yeah. So as part of their crop walking of that, they yeah, yeah. put their JSTOR version link there. Yeah, and you know, to, to an extent, I, I can understand that too, but that's the notion, oh, we're getting all the clicks. Sure, I, maybe, I don't know. But uh, it completely goes against the notion of a DOI, which is, meant, which is only a redirect, right? It just uh, redirects to whatever this landing page is identified as. Um, and therefore also absolutely depends on the custodian of this resource 
to update the mapping table if and when this URI changes of the landing page, right? If in this case, ACM tomorrow gets bought by Elsevier, then this URI will change. Right? The landing page may not change, but the URI will change. The UI should not change. So someone, in this case, in the new content owner, Elsevier, needs to go into CrossFit or whomever and say, hey, by the way, this UI doesn't go to this URL uh, up there anymore. It goes now to Elsevier, whatever, right? So, and if that mapping does not get updated, the DOIs are completely pointless as well. So it, it also depends on, still depends on the custodian to quote unquote do the right thing. And we know this does not happen all the time. We know the system is not perfect. It's, a, it's, it's at times a little bit of an, yeah, we, we're doing the right thing, but we actually don't have to practice. So an example of that is the physics preprint archive.org recently adopted DOIs. And in all our experimentation, anyways, we have not found a single link to an archive paper that has not worked anymore. So their URIs were very, very stable, still are very, very stable. So why do they need UIs? Right? Good question. Okay. Uh, so one of I, I had to bring this because I, I found it recently and it completely, you know, it, it amused me. So don't do this, right? So oops. You still see this okay uh that is apparently a real uh bibliography, bibliography section of a scholarly work and uh i i would bet money on the fact that this doesn't work tomorrow anymore right and yes it's google books i get it they're somewhat stable and, and have a lot of money and so on and so forth but still what are the chances that a uri that spreads across i don't know a dozen lines still works tomorrow right those sort of parameters that are in there well, yeah, it takes someone to flip a teeny tiny switch and those things break, right? And it's not necessarily always a correlation of length, but if it has that many parameters in there, the, this, this is not going to resolve uh, in future, in the near future, right, is my argument. So I would, I would say don't do this, don't choose those things. Right. Uh, another thing that we hear frequently is, hey, screenshots, screenshots solve this, right? Uh, yeah, things on the web disappear, but I, I took a screenshot of a tweet or something like that, and uh, that is archived, that is preserved. And the answer is no, it's not. So it's yes, it's better than well, maybe it's better than gone, but it's also easy to fake, right? It's easy to manipulate. Uh, this is an example of an article that just came across the other day, where this photographer won a, a photography prize, like a Sony something World Award, and then came clear as like, yeah, I don't accept this reward award because the uh, the award-winning picture was not taken by me it was uh, artificial intelligence creating this thing right so and, and he just did it to you know throw up the system a little bit and say hey you need to talk about these things this this things this happens right there is generative uh, artificial intelligence that creates stuffs not just text but also images um, we have these fun celebrating things here we need to talk about these other things so um my point here is that you know screenshots are probably better than nothing but are they reliable, right? Can you, would they hold up in court, for example? Mm, I don't know, right? So uh, there, there's a bit of a um, consideration that is purpose. So what can we do about it? There is, of course, a number of options that we can do. Uh, this is a concept that we came up with that I would like to uh, introduce briefly and, uh, and maybe give some pros and cons and, and uh, uh, tell you a little bit about how this can be used um to potentially make your scholarship a little bit more robust and uh it is uh, so robust links is the phrase for the concept that we uh, um, uh, coined or that we came up with and uh, i use the term robustifying your links uh, frequently and it's a real word word uh i, I like it so everybody's going to use it. robustifying your links is an action right it's a, it's a verb all right how does this work what should we do about it well there are a number of services on the web uh, that you are probably aware of, at least some of them, that we can use to create archival copies of web pages. You probably have uh, seen the Internet Archive uh, before, that is the oldest and uh, largest web archive in the world. Uh, it's free to use, uh, it's at, at no expense to you to use. Uh, and there are a number of other services that operate in a similar manner. Uh, often their technical underpinnings is different, uh, their financial model might be different, but all of these services here allow you to submit a URL to them and ask them to create an archival copy on your behalf, right? So the Internet Archive does it, archive.is 
uh, does it per CC? And I understand uh, Tamil has a has a relationship to the per CC and uh, subscription of yeah, sort. We're, we're a registrar. Registrar, perfect. Yeah. So there's an, uh, a larger quota uh, of of your rights that you can submit to them for for archival purposes, right? Yeah. Uh, Archive the web is a fairly new service, um, a Japanese service, um, uh, Mastodon, uh, allows you to do the same thing. So you can, for example, you're in a position to write your thesis, let's say, uh, you look at all the references to things on the web that you'd like to include. A good first step is to take all those references and submit it to one or more of those services to create archival copies of the state of the life version on the web as you want it to be uh, uh, tombstone, right? Because ideally, no one is messing with these archival records. Ideally, they're immutable. So once you put them in there, once you have them archived on your behalf, uh, the content is set in stone. And I say ideally because we don't have any guarantees for that. Um, that is the, the, the optimal, the, the perfect scenario, the perfect world. Um, we have not really seen uh, malicious cases of people uh, modifying archive content for you know, non kosher purposes, let's say. So ideally, those things are set in stone. Ideally, those, those don't change. That's a good first step. And it has been done or it is being done frequently. You've probably seen this. Uh, uh, there was an announcement about this as well when the Internet Archive started collaborating with Wikipedia, uh, language independent from what I understand, and uh, have an uh, IA bot that runs over all Wikipedia articles and identifies links to things uh, on the web, so they don't point back to Wikipedia, but to somewhere on the outside, and uh, creates archival copies of those references, right? And then uh, this is a little screenshot snapshot from the reference section in a Wikipedia page, where they say, okay, there's an, there's an FAQ, and by the way, this FAQ link has also been archived in the Wayback Machine, and has been archived on October 11th, 2007. So that's how the Internet Archive conveys the notion that they have created an archival copy and how to access it by simply clicking on this link. Right? So that's pretty good. At least you have an archival copy and we have a reference that it was archived. And uh, uh, the, the see also this FAQ link actually still points to the original URL. We'll get to this in a second. So that's good. And uh, the, the link to the Wayback Machine is displayed here. And um, if you enjoy reading URLs, you need to get up more. But I'm just saying that this is uh, an example of you can look at a link and you can still derive the original content from it, right? You can still say, okay, this, this archival link initially went to islandheritage.org uh, slash faq.html. That, that was the original resource that was archived and this uh, resulted in the archival link displayed here. So that's, that's pretty good. However, what about if we use a different web archive? PermaCC is an example. Uh, they give you, as shown you in the bulleted list in the middle there, they give you an archival URL that is completely cryptic. It has a hash value of sorts in there. But if you just see that in your archive, you don't know what the original resource is that you archived, right? You just have this string. So you're basically banking on the fact that the web archive will be around forever and will reference uh, dereference this link, right? If PermaCC or archive.is went away tomorrow, or uh, Mummy5 is another example uh, in the Italian domain, they have gone away. They have ceased operation, right? So we have a ton of Mummy5 links that are just, uh, they are not operational, they're not working anymore. So for that sort of a simple replacement, you just ex uh, um, exchange here, just replacing one link web problem with another, basically, right? Because there's nothing inherently stable or uh, permanent about a, a web archive. Right? We've seen this, we've seen web archives disappear. Uh, or cease operation of sorts, and in, in this case, you, you didn't gain much. You at some point did the right thing, but uh, um, for down the road, it didn't work out because the, the URI doesn't mean anywhere. And you cannot uh, retrieve the original URL from this link, right? from this archival record link. You don't know which page was archived if I show you archive.is slash mt, mku, whatever it is. Right? So that is, that is not the answer. The answer, or uh, one option for an answer is keep three pieces of information when you're linking to web resources. Right? So again, make an archival copy, then in return, you will get a, a link to the a URI that identifies this archival copy. Uh, and you keep these three pieces of information. You keep the original URL, that is crucial. 
you keep the URL of the archival record and you keep the date time of when you created this archival record. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. If you still have the original URL, um, and that works, perfect, right? If the uh, island heritage thing still worked, you could just click on that, like you click on any other link on the web, it works, great. If it doesn't work, you have as a, a fallback option the, uh, the archival link, or you can click on that and see whether that works. Uh, in the case of the Internet Archive, that probably still works. In the case of Mummify, it doesn't work anymore. So what do you do then? Well, there's the um, second fallback mechanism, which is the combination of the original URL and the date time of linking. As you probably know, those are the two pieces of information that you currently need to look up archival records at a web archive. Right? So if, God forbid, the Internet Archive disappears, you still have the original URL and you still have the date time that you can use in, for example, PermaCC and try to find a different archival copy at a different web archive. But at least you still have the original URL, which is your primary key, basically, for this lookup, right? And you have the date time to get an idea of how far back in time you have to go uh, to see what the state was that the author intended to uh, convey with this reference. Right? Does that make sense? Cool. Um, all right. Uh, again, I'm not too much going to dwell on details, but I'm, I want to show you an example of what a robustified link looks like. It's standard HTML. All browsers can deal, all, no browser will complain, right? No search engine or whatever will complain. And it conveys these three pieces of information that I just mentioned. So your original URL, and of course I had to make a copy of the college station website, right? Because it was just too funny. But the, uh, the original URL is still in the link. That's still great. The archival URL is conveyed to the data dash version URL attribute, again, standard HTML. And the date time of linking, I created this archival copy yesterday, last night, is conveyed in the data dash version date attribute. So now we have an HTML blob, an expanded link, a robustified link that you can use in your blog post, for example, in any of your HTML uh, publication or, or you know, works in general. Um, again, it, it works with all browsers. Um, you, whatever is the href um, uh, attribute will be the default location for the link. So if all your left mouse click links, mouse click things, go to the, uh, to, to the URL in the href, right? Interestingly enough, if you, if you think, or if there's a use case where you don't want the original URL in your href as your default link target, but you want the archival version in your default for the link target, you can swap those. You can put the permanent URI in the href, that would be your default link target, and you just change the version URL to the original URL attribute, and you're good to go, right? But there again, it's key to not just throw away the original URL, but also convey the original mm -hmm. URL in conjunction with the date time as a fallback mechanism, as uh, outlined a second ago. So this is, this works, this is fun. If you wanna see it in action, I, uh, we wrote a uh, code funded paper a while ago, Code Philip is also fun because it's HTML. So we, uh, we trick them into um, uh, um, um, including our robust links. So we robustified all our links, and I still love this term. We robustified all, all our links and uh, um, uh, put a little JavaScript in there to make them actually make them actionable. And you see on the, on the slide, it's maybe hard to see because of the uh, contrast, but there's a little, bit, little icon following each link, and you can click on this icon to activate the, uh, the alternative links, if you will. So this allows you now to click on the archive version or to click on a piece of infrastructure that I won't go into detail uh, that we host at the laboratory that allows you to look up an archival copy of that original URL at a different web archive because you have the original URL and the date time embedded in that link, right? So basically two fallback mechanisms in the case the default link target doesn't work anymore or shows the content that has drifted and is, is just, you know, the, the DL00 example. Right? So if you're interested in, in, in looking at it, what, it, what it can look like in action with a little bit of JavaScript, you can activate those robust links and make them actionable for a user. So I would go now, well, this is fun, but I'm not doing this for my dissertation, right? I have 300 references. No, not happening. So we built a little service that we call a uh, uh, robust links service uh, that allows you to just submit a URL and define a link text, an anchor text that you want to put as a label on your link. And uh, you hit 
robustify it, of course. Um, and it'll get you an interface, uh, or to, it'll take the original URL, submit it to a, a web archive. Uh, currently, it's either the internal archive or archive.is, randomly picks one of the two to increase robustness. Uh, and then gives you this interface where you can copy and paste the robustified HTML out of into your blog post, for example. So it makes it a little bit more convenient, right? You don't have to hand type HTML anymore. No one wants to do that. Uh, and it gives you the citations for the, for the JavaScript to include into your blog post, for example, to make them actionable. So a little bit more convenient to, to operate this thing. And of course, this still doesn't solve my problem of 300 references, but makes it a little bit more convenient. But we do have an API for this thing as well. So if you feel like uh, you know, right, uh, wrapping this into a script that does automatically for you, can send the same request against our API and get some JSON blob back that has the HTML embedded so they can just automatically ingest into your code. So you can really automate the robustification, still love it, uh, of, of, this, of this process and of all your links, right? Uh, with, with a few lines of code. So that's fine. Um, there are, of course, other environments that are relevant for this, one of which is Sotero uh, as a reference manager. So um, I had a colleague of mine uh, work on a Zotero extension, a robust links Zotero extension. So if you're familiar with Zotero, right, you have, for example, a browser plugin, just one button to ingest something into your Zotero library. This extension would trigger uh, uh, and use the URL that you have included into your library to send against the robust links API, robustify it, and then ingest the robust links code into and a notes document in your library. So then you can copy and paste the robust links HTML from your Zotero library into your blog post, for example. Or you can use the Zotero export citation function to export HTML out of it if you have an entire library of robustified links, which would be the holy grail, of course, right? Uh, export those. It does raise an interesting point, though. We talked about this earlier today of uh, citation styles, per se, right? How to in include this into uh, what are they all named, right? Uh, I should be a better librarian than I am. Um, and, and, and that's, that's of course, an, uh, a point of contention. It absolutely is, right? Because what I'm talking about here is all based on HTML, all based on, you know, clicking to the mouse. In a PDF document, in a typical, let's say, bibliography, uh, or that I use for my dissertation, for example, that would not have been possible. So at that point, you probably uh, look at uh, including two links per bibliography item, if you will, and a date time or something. It's similar to the Internet Archive example for Wikipedia, right? So that could be an option. All right, so what else we have? I, summary. So um, I did want to scare you a little bit. I did want to uh, raise awareness a little bit that this is a, an ephemeral environment that we're working in. Uh, links break all the time, right? We've seen links run all over the place. Uh, and things change all the time. And to an extent, I would make the case that link rot is less evil or can be less evil than content drift, right? So um, you click on a link, it breaks, big deal, okay, you move on sort of thing, right? Yeah, you may, you may not like it, but you at least know that something has gone wrong. You click on a link and the content has changed. Would you know that? Would you care? Does it make a difference? Who knows, right? So that's the, the, uh, the Supreme Court example uh, and, and this might be more nuanced, right? That you, the, everything looks okay, looks authentic, but you know, again, the, the decimal point has changed, or there's now a not in front of a, a describing term, for example. That makes a makes a big difference, and you don't necessarily know what the intention of the author was at the time of citing, right? So content drift to an extent can be a much much harder problem to identify, and then also to interpret, right? How bad has it got? Mm, yeah, who knows? So. Uh, maybe an evil student project, right? Modify all sorts of uh, content of references uh, that were, yeah, in, in your dissertation or something like that, and then see what what the overall content then is, is is like, right? How does this change your message mm -hmm. if your reference content changes? No, no, good question. <laughs> so, but regardless, right? That's the that's the environment that we live in. That's the, the situation that we have, and um, the all the benefits that we enjoy for sharing content come come with this sort of an um, uh, battlefield of uh, uncertainty, <laughs> let's put it this way. Sort of thing. So uh, there's absolutely nothing, and that's another point that I want to raise, there's absolutely nothing inherently stable or permanent about a web page just because you cite it, right? It doesn't mean anything to the custodian of the content mm -hmm. that you, you cite. 
Uh, we've seen it in the government laboratory websites, right? I keep uh, uh, bringing this home sort of thing. There's nothing inherently stable about that. It's just humans and uh, humans and make mistakes. Technology is not perfect. So uh, just because it has the label of laminar.gov doesn't mean it's permanent, right? Uh, maybe far from it. Uh, as social media is a completely different animal, of course, right? We've seen cases where students are not allowed to cite tweets in their theses because the, exception, uh, the assumption is that it's going to go away or uh, it's under custodianship of someone that we don't trust, let's say, right? So uh, we've seen the same with Wikipedia, but it, I think it was a different um, argumentation there, but um, content is, is ephemeral. That's the whole point, right? On the web. Which means because, sorry, because Sarah is not, does not care about uh, me citing her blog post, it is on me to make sure that I have a more permanent record than just a pointer to the life of the thing, right? It's on me, it's on the author. Uh, and of course, this could go by proxy. We could think of maybe uh, if I write a a paper that I'd like to submit to a conference, maybe the submission tool at EasyChair or something like that could do this on my behalf. Sure, right, fine. Maybe elsewhere, if I submit it for publication, could do it on my behalf. Sure. But of course, as especially as, let's say, a, a doctoral student uh, being, you know, this close to submitting my thesis, this is the best time to do this, right? Because you're highly motivated of delivering a, a good piece of work. You're somewhat motivated of creating a record for prosperity. Well, that's the time to do it, right? This is where you're most um, uh, uh, motivated. Uh, and this is the time when the life resource on the web represents what you're trying to cite, right? Uh, this may change at any point in time. So at some point, it's a, it's a race condition. So, right? um, so it's on us. We have to do this. Right? Uh, and the, the uh, robust links notion is one way of doing this. Uh, surely not the, other, not the only way. And, and maybe not the best way, who knows? Well, time will tell, I guess. But the point remains, creating archival copies is currently the only thing we can do. Uh, and then conveying the fact that an archival copy exists and ideally linking to that archival copy with as much information as possible is probably the best path forward, right? And as always in digital preservation, more copies, more better. So if you uh, use PermaCC and the Internet Archive and uh, maybe a couple others, you absolutely increase your chances that the resource that you're trying to cite is archived uh, for later use. Let's put it this way, right? Uh, time absolutely matters, right? So your date time, your time of linking is relevant. There are usually some timestamps associated with the publication, right? So also will tell you when your paper was published. But there are a gazillion of those timestamps, right? There's the publication for an online version and then the print version and the accepted manuscript and all kind of crazy terminology and timestamps that come up with, right? Uh, the only timestamp that really matters is yours, right? Because you know what you're trying to cite. Elsevier doesn't. So it's a it's a it's a proxy if you don't do it, but they do it, it's probably better than nothing, but you can do better, right? That's the whole point. So time matters. And I mentioned it as well. Oh, there's nothing inherently stable about web archives like mummify disappeared uh, websites i mentioned earlier uh, has ceased operation um things of that net nature so there's a, we're not necessarily in an environment where um business models for web archives are super solid right uh their um uh, sustainability models are you know time will tell again right but uh, right now we don't have a guarantee that the you know, archive will be around for the next 50 years right no one will give you that guarantee so uh just because at the end of the day it's just a website right that's the whole point so uh it's uh the best we can do right now uh hopefully it's last for a while let's say and of course it also raises the question of uh what is currently not possible with the web archiving infrastructure that we have at our disposal right so i mentioned social media which I'm sure you know is horrible to, to archive, right? Archival copies, try to archive your Facebook page. It's a disaster, right? Any sort of Twitter uh, uh, users you follow, try to archive that, it's a disaster. JavaScript is the reason why we can't have nice things, as one of my colleague said a while ago, right? Um, anything dynamic, anything uh, crazy interactive is a nightmare for crawlers and for web archiving infrastructure. Um, we're really good at archiving the stuff that we published 20 years ago, or 10 years ago, we're not all that good at uh, uh, publishing TikTok and things of that nature, right? However, if you talk to a historian uh, looking at you know the, the early 2000s, the basically the only resource they have is web archives, right? Because 
content is created online. So it's it's a it's a disaster. Journalists in the same sort of a, a realm, right? How how does a let's say thirty year old journalist apply for a job? Well, here are all the things that I've wrote, and of course they're all on the web. Are they still there, right? I mean, so so it, it's becoming increasingly important to to take care of these sort of things, and they will of course also you know increasingly so move into the legal domain, right? Uh, web resources, archived web resources, increasingly so will be used as evidence in court. It's, it's inevitable, right? And right now, it's, uh, there are a number of, uh, from what I understand anyways, this may not be the entire picture, a number of uh, uh, domain experts that uh, tell the court of how an archival copy is created. And then it's up to the judge basically to say, yeah, I believe it, I trust it, or no. Right? So there's no, no real framework. So we don't really know how to deal with that. However, it's, it's, it's our life, right? It's our content. So it will just be a matter of time until that happens. So. Uh, there are a number of other examples, like YouTube videos are horrible to archive, those sort of things, right? Um, but I'll, I won't go into detail there. So I think with that, I'll, I'll close out. I've been talking for way too long, I apologize. So um, anyways, I hope some of this resonated uh, with you. Uh, please do get in touch. I'm, I'm, I'm happy I'm happy about our collaboration with uh, 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 incredible colleagues from Texas A&M. Any sort of, we were looking at, right, it's, it's for the children. So we're looking at uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, I was trying to analyze what uh, uh, students do in their in their ETDs, uh, trying to come up with intervention points of how technology to be developed could make students' lives better by taking care of references, taking care of uh, online content that we're using, utilizing to make our case in ETDs. So that's an incredible, I think, field to explore. Uh, if you're interested in that, please do get in touch. Um, we're most happy to to talk, collaborate, and, and come up with new fun ideas. So hopefully this was not all crazy scary. Maybe you uh, took some away with it. Appreciate your time. Uh, a little bit more time. Apologize. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. It was fun. <laughs>